I'm so glad that you all made it today to talk about art and social justice. I'm um, thrilled to have you all here. And I thought what we could start with is, since we don't all necessarily know each other, introducing ourselves. Um, my name is Rocio Aranda, and I'm a curator and an art historian. I've worked in museums for almost 20 years, maybe a little bit more, actually. And um, I've known all of you through your amazing work. You've inspired work that I've done. And so I'm really happy that you're all here. And if you just want to tell a little bit about yourselves, if you were born in the US, if not, when you came to New York, um, how long you've been here, what, how has it inspired your work, and the kind of work that you do. OK. So hi, everybody. <clears throat> My name is Sol Aramendi. I am from Argentina. I moved here 15 years ago. And um, I am the founder of Project Luz and create work to further immigrant rights or labor, labor rights. Um, I consider myself an art worker, and uh, um, I work in the intersection of immigration, uh, art, and labor. My name is Alicia, Alicia Grullon, and I was born here in New York City. I was born in Inwood. And I want to be able to change the way that we, we relate to each other and the way that we see each other and the way that we be with each other, with race, gender, and class. So th that's what my work is about. Um, William Villalongo, and uh, I grew up in uh, Bridgeton, New Jersey, um, although I was born in Florida, Hollywood, Florida. But, um, and uh, my work, I, I make uh, paintings and works on paper um, that represent the black figure. Um, and the various ways in which uh, the figure um, has, that figure, I would say, has uh, dealt with visibility or invisibility uh, throughout art history and culture. Um, so the more recent work that I'm doing features a black male figure that is sort of a shapeshifter and is composed of these sort of small pieces of natural debris that kind of migrate and, um, and they kind of disperse or collect um, to either um, to find sort of form, to find its form. And uh, for me, uh, I'm, I'm thinking about the ways in which uh, black people have to navigate uh, space or, um, or accumulated notions of what it means to be black. Um, and how and so that so the work in a way is a sort of um, metaphor for that type of that sort of navigation. Um, you know, the pieces migrate, they they sh they shift and they reform. Um, and I often uh, include images um, that have a kind of historical significance to them to kind of uh, reinforce that notion of presence, of a sort of migratory presence. Uh, well, my name is uh, Guido, Guido Garaycochea. I was born in Peru. Um, I've been in the United States for the last 14, 15 years, uh, not in New York. Most of my life has been in Connecticut. I came uh, as an artist in residence to a program in London, and then I decided to stay a little longer and longer. And uh, I uh, co-founded with my husband a nonprofit organization there, Expresiones, which is uh, artist in residence. So we invite uh, artists from Latin America to spend a time there and uh, work for the community, as well as uh, develop a body of work that we reach out to the community. And uh, for the last uh, five years, more or less, I've been living in also back and forth uh, in New York. And uh, I, I work at a Queen Museum. I run the program The New Yorkers, so I'm happy to work with people like me, immigrants, facing this new challenge to be uh, new participants of this uh, new life here in the United States. And um, I consider myself a painter, however, also my art has evolved, and now I do a lot of other things. You know, you think about what are the causes of inequality, and there's so many of them, but one, two of them that I think are really crucial and that art can help to change are um, entrenched cultural narratives. And these are cultural narratives that have kept specific populations out of that discourse and that dialogue, right? We know how art history has left out many different kinds of artists of different backgrounds. So these entrenched cultural narratives, I think, can be shifted and changed by art. And the other one that's a driver of inequality is persistent prejudice, or in my, I think, 
for our, let's say, cultural purposes, it sort of means a belief that there are, um, you know, the groups of people who cannot or don't produce artwork, as opposed to the European discourse that looks at this historically. And so I think each of you, in a way, are working to counter those discourses and create change, like just what you were saying about changing the world. You came to choose doing the kind of work that you do. How Was it specifically something that called you to that kind of work, or did it develop as um, a reaction to being an immigrant and having a different kind of a life? How, I think each of you got into it for different ways and different reasons, and it'd be great to talk a little bit about that. In my case, uh, when, when I moved here, I became an immigrant, and that uh, you know it took it, it took me some times of individual exploration and um, to maybe two three years to really arrive and feel like I was here, um, and that was you know the way that I was observing the world, how that was responded to me. But also, I, I was in contact with a lot of immigrant organizations, um, understanding the privilege that I came here by a plane, no? compared with all the other immigrants um, that are the communities that I work with now, that is, you know, they cross the border, and um, all the, the things that that means. So that's when I started, uh, instead of just looking at myself, looking at the bigger problem. And uh, in a way, I was also doing personal work, photography and things, uh, working by myself. And I was teaching photography with Project Luz, uh, working with immigrants. So then it was actually through curators and through conversation that I realized that my real art artwork was in this pedagogical space uh, of the classroom. And that's where I was doing all this work. And that's where we were working about to create uh, immigrant narratives by immigrants and uh, also immigrant images by immigrants. So it was a long process of many years, but that's when I realized that that was my artwork. <laughs> Part of my work as an artist is to do cross-pollination in between different organizations and disciplines. Lo que están viendo aquí es, eh, you are looking at the application, the last version. Quiero explicar de qué se trata la aplicación. Y le dice, ok, arreglamos 100 pesos, ¿no? Para ir hoy a trabajar. Al final del día, ¿el qué le dice? Supongamos, dice, bueno, vení mañana, te pago. Y uno va mañana y él desapareció. Se necesitan tres cosas. La foto del carro con la, la placa, ¿no? la, el lugar de trabajo y el día que usted trabajó. ¿no? Entonces, ¿qué pasa? Pongamos, si un señor viene y nos roba acá en Queens, ya le tengo la foto de su camioneta, y esta vez si le puedo tomar una foto al señor, yo la publico y todos los compañeros de los centros que van a venir, está en Island Centro, Brooklyn, Bronx, les va a salir automáticamente a los compañeros que están buscando trabajo. I started off as an actor um, in another life. And so, <laughs> so, and it was during the time of, um, I'm not going to reveal my age, but it was not in this century. <laughs> so it was at a time that, you know, you didn't have faces like me going into an audition. Um, and I started being acutely aware that my presence created a narrative that I didn't necessarily create, but I was marked immediately. Um, and that would mark what roles I was, I, I didn't get, obviously, but the roles that I did get. And it was, and I had a moment, my first audition was with Spike Lee, it was for Girl Six. And I walked in, he was not there, but I walked in and um, the casting director held up the, the headshot and she said, is this you? And I was like, I can't do this anymore. Um, so that, that moment of saying, I'm not going to do this anymore, and I'm going to discover something else based on my interest, but also 
a moment where I realized that there was something in, in this signification of my body, and, and that led me to, to go into, um, into more photography. And that's what I did my graduate studies in. Um, and, and then along the way, I, I realized um, through the power of self-portrait that there was there is something where you're no longer, you're no longer your body. Like my body has always been my first instrument. And then going back to that place of comfort, but realizing that um, it, it stands for, for many other things. And it's not my intention, it's just because of, of, of the visual history, of image history, and, and, and how it's been used. Um, and that's how I started doing more performance work. Um, an audition tape that you did, I think, for William Pobell's project. Yeah. Maybe tell us a little bit about that. Oh, that was for um, Miss Black Factory, and that was my, um, my last semester in graduate school. And uh, Patty Phillips was my mentor at uh, Patricia Phillips. We called her Patty, but Patricia Phillips was my mentor at, at New Paul. So she encouraged me. She's like, you should, you should apply. Why don't you apply to this? And so that piece, he had everyone audition to explain why they wanted to be Miss Black Factory, and that was the aha moment because I hadn't really seriously considered using, actively using my body in that way, although I was making these self-portraits, but it was just a minute of, um, of that audition. So it was, we had to have a two-minute audition. He made it incredibly difficult, and I think he was having fun with it, so we had to do it on VHS. So I had to get a VHS camera, and, and do a two minute reason of why I should be Miss Black Factory. And so I was these four different characters. Um, one was an English accent person. Um, one was a overly assimilated um, US accent person. Um, one was a more um, urban, urban um, Latina person. And the last one was a, a, a person with a, a Spanish accent. Or, or a very gray, vague <laughs> European mm -hmm. accent, because I found that those kind of fit the way I looked, and I was really addressing that and address, addressing blackness, or Miss Black, because he was very open. Like Miss Black Factory doesn't have necessarily be a person who is directly of African descent. It could he he spanned it and he made it um, a really interesting conversation on on what what black is. Um, so yeah, that was the audition, Miss, Miss Black Factory. It was code switching. I want to be Miss Black Factory because it's an opportunity to be a diplomat. It's an opportunity to represent people who don't have a representative, people who don't have a president to go out there and speak for them. Um, I want to be Miss Black Factory because I want to be a diplomat. I want to be a diplomat for um, people that we don't take the chance to represent every day in our lives because we're too busy or because maybe higher powers deem them not not important um, sort of like Hotel Rwanda you know um, we didn't help all those people because we didn't feel they had any economic value um, and I also think it'll be fun um, it'll be a lot of fun going around um, the country in a black factory because so many people um, haven't experienced that. Um, I'm not even mentioning multiculturalism, I mean, um, outside of television. Uh, I'm a bit excited about the client in this black factory. Um, I feel I'll make a good candidate because um, I feel I want to be a diplomat, you know? I, I want to be a, a messenger for peace, an envoy, sort of, a good envoy for, um, for all the necessary things that we have to do now. I, I also enjoy helping people. I enjoy trying to, to leave an imprint in, in, in the sand. Um, even if the waters will come and wash it away, um, it was made, it was done. It made a change for the time it had to. And being black in art school, and that immediately puts you in a, and if you want to paint, and if you're interested in the figure, you're immediately draw, drawn into a kind of Western narrative 
of history that you're completely inundated right. with. I guess one of the things that, that came fast was the realization that just the, just the image of a, of a black person is immediately like, you know, politicized, like have to take that politic and actually make it work for the, for the art and work for me or, um, or do something completely, maybe do something completely different. Yeah, as I said before, my, uh, my art has evolved. I think that uh, at some point I, I put together a lot of things that I have in my mind. Like uh, before I had my art very contemplative in my studio, like was part of, I was trained for. And on the other hand, I had some like volunteer, uh, you know, works that I have always done with uh, kids with HIV, etc. Always have something like that in my life. But uh, at some point, looking for, for, for hours of teaching in 2007, I, I was sent to a correctional. And then everything started to have sense for me. And um, so I went to this uh, female correctional, and I started to, to have um, an, um, art classes there. And uh, through the years, because I have done that since then until now, I'm still going once a week. And uh, I have seen the process that have had some of my now friends there, but also my own transformation about um, asking myself, what can I do to, to change this? Uh, what can I do to be the voice of those that, you know, our society has uh, uh, taken away, you know, all their rights? We have a huge problem in this country about uh, incarceration and it's a, a very interesting to say something true that the government has used to disenfranchise you know part of the population a lot of immigrants look up you know a black and brown population my people is there in you know huge amount of, of number and uh, so I, I sure I have to do something uh, so I've been developing uh, my work which is very related to that and still I do paintings and um, mixing collage images and uh, I, I do also uh, these interviews with um, um, some kind of <clears throat> the visual response that the, the inmate has to those interviews. But it's a long process. It's a long process because as an active um, a volunteer, I cannot have contact with the inmates while they are there and after they are released there is a time which is years until I can get in touch with them again. So it, it takes, takes a lot of time but uh, I do a lot of magic here and there and uh, I, I can have some material and uh, we work together and, uh, and one of my best friends are you know people that I have met there. That's what I can say about uh, how they have transformed me. From my holding cell and brought me to this room where they take your fingerprints and, and he just told me that somebody was badly injured and that somebody was dying in the hospital because of me. And I don't know, that Thursday she ended up her life. She used the bed sheets and tied it around her neck and tied it onto the metal piece from her bunk bed. And yeah, that's beautiful. Um, I think this question of the community is really important in, in all of your work in different ways, whether it's people that you work with directly, maybe it's students that you're teaching because you're deeply influential in their development also. Um, so it'd be great to hear a little bit about how you come, how you work specifically with community, how you define it, and maybe talk a little bit about its role in your work, um, and even if it's you know in terms of teaching or other kinds of projects. The participation of the community is not symbolic or uh, nominal, but is part hands-on uh, in the projects, um, informing the project, but also making decisions, uh, uh, creative decisions of the structure of the project. Um, sometimes I'm just, uh, I don't know, I'm there, but everything is happening 
just, I'm just creating the space or making space and everything is happening. Um, and I also, I trust completely on the knowledge of the community to, to create the projects and um, we never know what we're gonna do until we are together and we decide together and then, okay, by the process of listening, storytelling, um, then I can start thinking of other things that I can bring into this space, but the community is very important. We are creating together. Maybe also say a little bit about um, teaching photography and language also through Project Luz, which I think is really important. I started at something uh, just teaching photography, but right away I started asking uh, different museums. I sent a letter to MoMA, to Queens Museum, to El Museo, to different museums 15 years ago to get a free uh, visit to the museum and in Spanish. And uh, those letters that I sent 15 years ago made the project grow because I still have a partnership with MoMA. Uh, uh, the, project through the Queens Museum, the project, they actually hired me to be that person that was going to do the, the, thing, the tours and everything in Spanish with the, with the workers I did with, the, with different museums. But part of my project also is to create access, uh, to bring conversations that we don't have about immigration, but real conversation about immigration in a museum, to talk about labor rights, in an art gallery to talk about labor rights in a museum or in a cultural space. Um, but I'm in the classroom, I teach, that's a different type of community, um, still a very um, large community and I think, I think about how I can bring you know, myself and my knowledge of how my perspective and looking are, are into that space as opposed to kind of replicating a, uh, the kind of a, a Western narrative, um, but how to kind of break up the hegemony of that um, narrative in the classroom um, and, and I curate as well of what's happening um, in art and not sort of sit back and let that be sort of handed to us by large by institutions. It brings together about a century worth of um, black press meaning publica publications, um, historical publications um, with contemporary art all with a focus on talking about how um, black self identity has sort of evolved and challenged um, racist image culture over the past century, or mostly the 20th century. How can I, you know, bring William Villalongo from, you know, a black and brown community in South Jersey um, and what that experience is into, the, into this uh, sort of thing, art, art world? Yeah, onto the larger stage of yeah. art history. Yeah. One of the biggest influences in my work are activists and activism um, and, and the act of, of organizing because I feel that that's when we're at our best um, and we are trying to really like, change the trajectory of how we do everything every day because it's very, it's, it's, it's been done for so long from one perspective. So it's, it's been done, for example, you know, we often talk about patriarchy and how to dismantle the patriarchy and how to change a different way of doing it so that it's not perhaps so vertical because it's always been so vertical and it's more horizontal um, or ways that it, we even start talking about ourselves like even how we talk about ourselves our biographies it's it's you know lists checks and lists of accomplishments but how do we start introducing ourselves and using our bios as a way of how we are as human beings so that's been that's been very influential in my work um, when I when I and I see it specifically done in, in activist circles. There are different ways of bringing that conversation into into artwork, and I think you know with the rule is love. I think that's how I I, I bought those conversations into it as, as snippets because those conversations that activists have and, and artists who you know collectors of, of artists who who do activism as their art. Um, you know, th that process and those spaces are very special, they're very sacred because they are really changing the momentum. So to bring aspects out of that, like in, in the piece The Rule is Love, where 
Rocio, um, you took part in it, where there, it's, it's a series of work, but the second rule is love. I did on 14th Street, so I was guided from Avenue C to Hudson Street blindfolded, and I couldn't speak, and my hands, I wasn't able to move my hands. And I, I depended on people to, strangers, and, and then people, so supporters and, 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 and dear, 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 dear friends to come and, and help me get across. Um, and, but they could only address me by saying one of the names of, of, of 70 women who were killed by police violence. So they had to address me by Sandra Bland, move to the right or move to the left, through the, you know, crowd on a Saturday on Union Square. So, I mean, that's an aspect that I, I took from activism. And I, like, I think of Martin Luther King, like he brought love into the dialogue of, of organizing, which we always kind of push it away. We live in such a competitive society where it's like, you can't even talk about that. It's called, it's too feminine. It's too, it's too soft and weak, but it's, it's one of the, the hardest things to do. When I came to this country, I realized that I was an immigrant, so it takes time to digest that idea, and but also it took time to me to understand that, however, I was an immigrant, something I, I never thought to be, uh, but also it was, uh, I was in a place of privilege. And so thinking about that, I, I well, I, we create this nonprofit and this, this uh, artists in residence. They are artists in residence now at their schools. And so they develop these projects in these public schools, um, not all of them, but some that we have some partnership is, and, um, and that way the kids are going to, number one, are going to have this contact with this uh, um, well-educated artist that is very proud to be uh, part of Latin America, but at the same time, they are going to, the product of that is going to be shown at, at the gallery that used to be a, a, a restaurant that we are renting, and uh, they are going to show the, the work they do with the artists with the work of the artists at the same, in the same place. Thank you all for participating. Give yourselves a round of applause. You did amazing work. Thank you.